There was a lot of heat, but not much light generated at Kensington Town Hall over the help the French government is giving to its farmers. A figure of 410 million has been quoted as being the subsidy the French government have dished out, mainly in the form of direct grants. Well, unlike the delegates making their fine speeches, Bernard Matthews is up at the sharp end of the problem. His plans for expansion were recently turned down by the local council, and he's been receiving some pretty attractive offers from the French to encourage him to move across the Channel. At the recent conference of the British Turkey Federation, he made a vigorous attack on the French for subsidizing their turkey producers and thus breaking the Treaty of Rome. He claims that, thanks to this illegal assistance, French exports of Turkey to Britain increased from one and a half million pounds to seven million pounds in 1980. So exactly what help does a French turkey producer get that an English one doesn't? With me now is Bernard Matthews. Well, why are they getting a much better deal than we are, or you are? Well, they've got a whole series of uh, national aids uh, that are not applicable uh, to turkey producers in this country at all. Uh, uh, first of all, there, there are capital grants um, that add up to a total of 35%, freely available. Um, and in addition, there are, there are low interest rate loans at 3 to 5% below the going rate for money through Credit Agricole and such organisations as this. And on top of that, there's something called a reversionary loan. And this, in effect, is another gift. Now, this is another 100% of the capital cost of a new factory. Uh, the interest rate on that particular money is placed officially at 3 to 5%, but it's quite clear that if you don't make a profit, then you never pay that loan back. In other words, it's a gift. But is this all over France or just in Brittany? Well, it's particularly in Brittany because I think, strategically, the French have decided to develop their, their poultry industry in Brittany because it's easier to get access to the UK and to other markets through French ports in Brittany. Uh, but the fact of the matter is it does apply to large sections of uh, France. In fact, uh, if you look at a map, it looks as though Paris is about the only place that's missing. But I think if we're going to compare the French position to the English position, British position, we've got to compare like with like. What would the position be if you went to, say, Linwood, where they've just closed down that car factory? Uh, well, that, that I don't know. But, but if I may say so, t two, two wrongs don't make a right. And the fact of the matter is that uh, it's, the, it's one of the bedrock principles of the Treaty of Rome that uh, individual countries do not produce a situation through national aids that distort trade in the product as it crosses the border. Yes, but we, of course, get some capital grants ourselves. As a farmer, I get the odd bit when I shove up a barn, and I imagine you must have had a bit of help here over the years, have you? Uh, no, 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 none at all. No, nothing no, no, from no, local government, national government? No, I've never, I've never taken grants. Um, does this therefore mean that the French can produce their turkeys, their poultry, a great deal cheaper than you can. Well, if, they, if you've got no capital invested, you don't have to make a profit to start with. Or, you, or a very small profit is a handsome return on the capital employed. Um, the French have just built one new uh, turkey factory in Brittany. Uh, this costs six and a half million pounds. Now, the, as the fellow hasn't produced the capital, hasn't got to service that capital, he's, I don't know, six to seven hundred thousand pounds ahead per annum before he begins. Is this why they're importing a great de exporting a great deal more turkeys than they were? Well, this, this is part of their overall policy. I think it should be understood that the French aim to become the food producers of Europe, and, and, the, and the British uh, farmer better understand this. This, this is the approach that, and the road they're on, and the French government is backing it up with these large sums of money to help people uh, to, to, to export because they haven't got oil. This is their problem, but they seem to be exporting their problem to us. But now a chap like you, who by clearly must be jolly efficient to be the size you are. Are you thinking of exporting your turkeys into France? Uh, no, not at the moment, because uh, the, the product that they, that they require is somewhat different to ours. Uh, the French market is a totally fre a fresh market, as distinct from our market, which is 95% frozen. Do they have fewer regulations they have to abide by than we do? Uh, certainly they do. Uh, not only do we have the problem with, with uh, unfair subsidization of the capital and all the rest of it, uh, but the fact of the matter is that the standards of inspection health-wise in a French processing factory bears no re resemblance to those insisted upon by the Ministry of Agriculture in this country. Less, he less healthy, less clean stuff coming well, out I, of France. Well, I'm not going to say that. All I'm saying is that the standard of inspection is, is, is different, uh, and I'll give you an example of it. In, in my factories, I've got two full-time veterinary officers standing there all of the time that turkeys are being processed and 18 poultry meat inspectors that I have to pay for through the local authorities. In France, you'd have a job to find one of those persons in one of those factories. So, so our poultry industry, for a start, has a bill of over £4 million per annum, which is over and above any figure that the French have got. 
So what do you reckon we should do about it, or rather the government should do about it? Well, I think the government should clamp down completely on all French meat imports into this country, because that's the only language the French understand. I mean, this is just uh, one of a number of things. We've seen apples that have been grown on subsidised apple trees. We've seen fish being landed in ports in France that would, that would, would have been thrown back in the sea by British fishermen. And now we've got turkeys that, and, and chickens that are being produced in poultry plants uh, uh, that have been produced with money from the French government. Thank you very much indeed, Bernard Matthews. Next week, we're looking at some of the pig schemes being offered by the various feeding stuff companies. Meanwhile, that's all from us today. Goodbye. This is BBC One, and now, farming. say to my staff, we lift these potatoes from the time they're set until the time they go in the bags, they're never touched by hand unless they're rejected. Now, we do this all in bulk and move hundreds of tons of potatoes at a time, but yet each individual potato the housewife buys and she looks at it and she scrapes it to see. And the thing the housewife likes least of any is to have a damaged potato. But she normally buys them in a plastic bag, so yes. she'll never see them, well, unless they're very bad. I know, but uh, when she peels them, or bakes them, or washes them, or chips them, she handles each one individually. Good afternoon. That was Dennis Weston, and that attitude to the humble potato helped win him last year's Seba Geige Award for individual marketing. We're going to devote most of today's programme to taking a closer look at his 5,000-acre farm in Lincolnshire. But first the news, and tomorrow Europe's farm ministers meet in Brussels for the first round of price talks. They'll be considering the Commission's proposals announced this week, which amount to an average 7.8% uh, price rise. That's not much more than half what COPA and the NFU were asking for. The details for milk, 7% on average over the year, plus an unchanged co-responsibility levy. And the super levy set at 36% on excess production. For meat, the target prices for beef and pig meat go up by 9%, and for sheep meat, 6%. Turning to cereals, the intervention price for wheat, barley and maize goes up 6%, while the target price for feed grains is set to rise 9%, and for wheat, 8%. But the reference price for milling wheat is held to no more than 4%. For oil seeds, the rape intervention price goes up 8%, and that's the basic position. But there are other ideas. For instance, the Commission want a levy on milk produced mainly from concentrates. So if you've more than about a cow and a half per forage acre, you'd pay 6% co-responsibility, not 2. They also want tougher criteria for beef intervention. No heifers, for example. And a co-responsibility levy for cereals and oilseeds. That would set a quota. And 1% would be docked off the intervention price for each 1% of total production over that limit. Mr Paul Dalsaga, the new farm commissioner, has said that adopting these proposals is vital if the community's farm spending is to be kept within budget limits. But the word from Brussels suggests little chance of the concentrates levy on milk or the beef changes being accepted. And the cereal quotas would probably be set too high to have any real effect. The other crucial proposal for Britain is the 5% cut in MCAs. That's about a 6% green pound revaluation. This has led NFU President Richard Butler to denounce the package as amounting to a disgraceful discrimination against Britain, which would be gravely damaging to the industry. He predicted it could mean a further fall in real income this year of 25 to 30%. Well, one thing's sure, the package has very few friends, so any settlement is likely to take about as long as last year. The uh, other big news this week is on sugar beet. The Commission proposed a 7.5% price rise and a British quota of 1.09 million tonnes. But at home, the British Sugar Corporation has announced the expected closures of four factories. They're at Selby, Nottingham, Ely and Felsted. But that leaves 13 modernised factories with a processing capacity 
in excess of our record output last year of 1.15 million tonnes. Well, now back to Dennis Weston and his attitude to potatoes is a good example of the way marketing the crop is slowly becoming more sophisticated. In this country, we eat five and a third million tonnes of potatoes, according to the most recent estimate. And 90% of that is grown at home, with just 2% of home production going for export. Looking at the potatoes we eat, three quarters are sold to the domestic market raw, and a quarter go for processing. Most raw potatoes are bought loose, with about 8% of total consumption pre-packed. Favourite varieties for home cooking, Desire, Pentland Squire, and the traditional King Edwards. Processing potatoes are of increasing importance. Nearly 11% is frozen, and Maris Piper is a popular variety here. Just under 9% goes for crisps, mainly record. Nearly 5% is dried, often from outgrades, and just 0.2% goes for canning. Well, then there's the growing demand for baked potatoes for fast food shops. Dennis Weston has reassessed his potato business in the light of a changing market and has expanded his potato acreage to 600. It brought success, but that's only part of his total farming business in Lincolnshire. Concrete is the latest product from his land. Last summer he took over part of an old airfield, which meant an opportunity to expand his arable acreage. But he's not content to use the runways as an airstrip for his own plane, as Oliver Walston found out when he visited the farm last November. Well, this is what I always think of Lincolnshire as looking like, great big flat treeless airfields. It's, it's almost like being on a set of the Dam Busters. What's a nice farm like you doing in a place like this? Well, uh, basically, we bought this for the land which had been not cropped since 1940. All the ploughable land we have ploughed and it's all been put in with bounty winter wheat. And what's going to happen to the runways? You, well, we're taking these up, uh, removing the concrete, and then the whole area will be tile drained where the concrete was, the topsoil has been stripped. I had thought about putting topsoil back on again, but I think it'd be better to keep the area under concrete, grass it down, and try and get some organic matter back into it and graze young stock or have it for conservation. When you buy a piece of land like this that at first glance looks pretty unpromising with all this concrete, how long a time scale are you thinking about? I, It'll be years yes. before you get your money back after the concrete's been the, taken up and the grass has gone down. Well, right? I've occupied this six months. Now, I think in three years' time, the concrete will have all gone. Obviously, it'll take more than three years to restore the land, but the money that the concrete's made, the concrete in this part of the world is a very saleable commodity and the land that's under the concrete will stand at virtually nothing. Are you saying that concrete's more profitable than wheat around here, then? Oh, yes. <laughs> Dennis Weston is used to turning unpromising material into productive farming land. This soil was once carpeted with dense grassland interspersed with willows and was useful only for rough grazing and that only when it wasn't too wet to carry stock. When he came to drain the land, the job was held up by these bog oaks found buried between 18 inches and 4 feet down. Carbon dating shows they're about 20,000 years old, and they all lie in the same direction, flattened by the inrushing tide of a prehistoric storm. As the peat shrinks, they work their way to the surface and need to be dragged out to allow cultivation. The effort has proved worthwhile, despite local opinion which reckoned the job of reclamation was so difficult, the field became known as Western's Folly. Which bit of the farm is this? Are we in the middle right now? No, this is uh, the Willoughby block on the east side. So we're right at the edge of the farm now, aren't we? Yes, right? this is the absolute uh, edge of the block nearest the sea at Willoughby. And How far are we from the sea right now? We'll be about five miles here from the sea. Five miles. So at one yeah. stage the sea came yeah. in this far? Oh, well, actually, the sea came in here. In 1952, all this land really? down here was flattened by... The Where salt. we're standing right now? Uh, and yes. then they put up the defences, all yes, the, yes, the dikes? Yes, yes, yes. Will it ever flood again, do you think? I hope not. But uh, basically, it's, as long as it can be drained, and the drainage is absolutely the key factor in this area, as long as it can be drained, it's fertile land. But uh, it, all the water has to be pumped out 
to see from here. Well, how high above sea level are we? You said it's well, at uh, uh, this, it, uh, at this, where we stand now would be two or three feet higher than high tide level, meaning that the water would not gravitate out here unless it's pumped out. Once you've tile drained right, a field it, like this, it, it, how long will those drains last before you or your successors have to do it again? On peatland, you get the soil shrink and so on. I would think that that will have to be done again in about 20 years' time. Now, on the clay, with clay subsoil, I'm hoping it will be here in 100 years' time. When you say on the peatland, yeah. uh, the shrinkage, does that mean the actual level of the peat it is dropping? The level of the peat oxidizes and it actually falls and uh, becomes into a it's the clay base. Some of this land we have layers of peat under the soil. We've got clay on the top, some we've got the peat on the top. But since you've been farming here, yeah. what, what would the level of that, that field out there have dropped by? Would it have dropped a oh, noticeable amount in, in your farming life? Uh, I, I wouldn't... I, I, I would have thought that it might have dropped two or three inches. As much as that? that? Yes. Good Lord. But yeah. a light land farmer like me considers yeah. this to be real man's land. Yeah. This is sort yeah. of wheat land. Yeah. Is, yeah. It, is it difficult to work? Well, it's land that you want to be off in the autumn, ploughed in the autumn and away. But this will grow potatoes and uh, sugar beet. I've had sugar beet here. Yeah. And then when we get near to the sea, we run nearly up to the sea, some of that is really strong marine clay. And does this mean you have to arrange your you cropping have, in such a way yes. to take account yeah, of the soil? Yes. The, uh, on the really strong land grow grass, uh, vining peas mm. and nearly continuous wheat. And this type of soil will grow sugar beet, vining peas, potatoes and wheat. And on the light land? Uh, very much similar, very much similar. With 5,000 acres to crop, each operation can be on a reasonable scale, despite the variations in soil type. Sugar beet covers about 600 acres, and last year yielded 16.5 tonnes an acre at about 16.5% sugar, enough on this land to leave a reasonable profit. The beet follows vining peas, feeding off the legacy of nitrogen left in the soil. These mobile viners tackle 750 acres a year, that's second in size to cereals, exclusively wheat. The peak autumn workload caused by 1,200 acres of potatoes and sugar beet means that some goes in in the spring. But last year, over 2,000 acres of winter wheat were grown and for the first time yielded, on average, over three tonnes to the acre. But the crop that interests Dennis Weston the most is potatoes. The markets that we really look for uh, can be split into the ware market, which is in banks. Yeah. Is this uh, one, these, these potatoes yes, here? Yeah, there's the ware market. market. The processing market, which includes the uh, ones for chip manufacturing and crisp, and also for canning potatoes. Yeah. The export trade, we export quite a lot of potatoes. Export, you're exporting, exporting potatoes, potatoes from here? Yeah. Oh, yes. Where yes. to? Which, well, which are your the, main customers? The main customers are at present uh, the Canary Islands. It's a bit like Coles to Newcastle. I thought we got yeah. early potatoes from yeah. the Canaries. And then we supply you them. You send it to them. them. Yes. And then also for Scandinavia. And we're looking very hard at Eastern Europe and uh, Germany for next year. I always got the feeling that if you were going to export things like potatoes, you had to do it on a very large scale and probably be a cooperative. You seem to think it's OK to do it all by yourself. How is it possible for an individual to do it? Well, the essence of the Canary Island trade is basically that these potatoes go on boats which have delivered tomatoes to this country. And the shippers require quite large tonnages over a short time. And often we're putting them up ready for the export market and we don't know where we'll be delivering them to until the boat actually docks. So you have enough potatoes here yes, to actually yes, fill yes. a boat? Yes. Did you ever consider joining a cooperative? Yes, I, I have considered joining, but uh, I feel that uh, a cooperative has not any benefits that I can't get from my own marketing. Does that mean you're, you're saying really you're big enough to be your own cooperative? Yes, that's very true.
the export trade fascinates me in a way because I, I don't expect to find an individual partner exporting. How did you find out that there was a demand abroad? Well, the demand came several years ago when we used to grow potatoes for seed. And there was a, an intermittent demand, and then the exports were banned to the Canary Island for several years. But having said that, I had these connections before this ban on the export of uh, potatoes. So there was a knock on the door, and a Spanish yeah, potato yeah, merchant yeah, said, yeah. Do you have any well, potatoes to let us have? Yeah, well, week? basically. And then you mentioned Scandinavia. Yeah, is, yeah. Is, a, is there a prospect? Well, a I, prospect I think that we are, if we can keep our cost of production low enough, uh, which is this, and we can provide the article they want. Yeah. Uh, there's, a, there's a market there for us. Now, you say the, art, the article they want. Is it a more demanding market? Are there tighter specifications? Well, tighter specification, and obviously, when they travel on the boat, if there's anything the matter with them, yeah. uh, they've got a longer time, they must be set in their skins, and they must be completely disease free, because if you then have some trouble, uh, when they've been on the boat. Eel worm primarily or all diseases? We must have all these countries require a certificate that they are grown on eel worm free land. So, although you're too modest to say it, it sounds to me as if you've got to be a particularly above average potato grower if you want to get some exports. Well, I wouldn't say that. I would say that you have to take a little bit more care. When you're handling an annual crop of nearly 8,000 tonnes worth around half a million pounds, care throughout the operation is essential. 40% by value goes for pre-packing and processing, like this load, with roughly 30% each to export and the bag trade. But Dennis Wesson isn't interested in an all arable farm. He runs four dairy herds, totaling 400 cows, and rears his own replacements. With so many other dairy farmers giving up, had he ever had any doubts? No, I'm satisfied with the margin that we're obtaining, and uh, I I think that there's a quite a good future for livestock in this area. I think were, were we can you... produce milk as cheap as this part of the world as anywhere else in Britain. Were you ever tempted by the common market golden, golden milkshake? Well, obviously I had a look at it. But you turned it down? Yes. When you say you can yes. produce milk yes. cheaply, yes. does that mean you grow a lot of grass? Well, the basic ration is grass. We use, feed quite a substantial amount of sugar beet pulp and uh, certain... Um, but what in constant? Which you feed in the parlour yeah. or, or out well, here? Both in the parlour and outside. What sort of herd average are you getting these days? I mean, per cow? Well, uh, we're on about 6,700 litres of milk sold per year for the cows and heifers. So that includes heifers and everything? It's not everything. bad at all. What, what, are you, what are your future plans? Are you going to expand the dairy at all, or, or beef, or sheep, or anything else like that? Well, um, we have got plans for another dairy herd. But um, just at present, with the high cost of money, um, the, um, but I, I'm quite convinced that we will expand. Our, our policy is expansion, and, uh, well, we're making adequate return on our capital. I intend to expand the dairy. We've also got in the assessment stage, and I suppose going on to put a beef feed lot up, basically these... Well, on the American style, just yes, buying in animals, uh, fattening them and taking selling them out, them out. Again. Yeah, and this will be based on grass silage and uh, sugar beet top silage. Sugar beet top tops, silage. which will mean carting it off the field, yeah. which gets a bit yeah. expensive. And you really think, do you, that with the cost of putting up a building, not to mention yeah. the cost yeah. of picking yeah. up yeah. beet tops, yeah. you can make beef pay? I think that if you look at the price of beef today, and look at the cost of providing energy, which we have to, to convert into beef. I think this is the most economical way to do it. And as long as I can keep my capital costs of the building down low enough, and I can get a big enough throughput on them, I think it's on. Dennis Weston's farming operations have had a major impact on the landscape. He once bought a farm where no field was bigger than five acres. Now, there are only two fields instead of over 40, and each one covers 100 acres. I wouldn't expect to see trees on an airfield like this, but in general, Lincolnshire doesn't have a great many trees or hedges, and there's been a bit of a fuss recently. Do you feel you've got a duty as a farmer to preserve this countryside of ours? Well, I, I most certainly do. I mean, I have 
pulled up many, many miles of hedges. I pulled up several trees. But I think that a lot of people, it's very easy to see what you've taken out, but very rarely do people notice or comment about the hundreds of trees that I have set and the plantations, and there's far more area that I have set than I have destroyed. You, you, you're really sure about that? Oh, I'm so, convinced. So many people I know say that trees and farming don't mix with big machines and small fields. Well, our field size is all the time increasing, but we now plant, you know, the odd corners up, and the um, places where there used to be cottages were pulled down. Mm. Um, last year, I planted over a thousand trees. Mm. The countryside has altered considerably. But I can say I'm keen on birds and wildlife. There's far greater variety of wildlife now than there was 30 years ago. I see you've got a Royal Society for the Protection of Birds yeah, sticker yeah, on your cake. Yeah. Some people might accuse you of having your cake and eating it. You know, on the one hand, pulling out the hedges yeah. in which the birds nest, and on the other hand, paying money to protect the birds. Yeah. Well, uh, put it this way, take this airfield for a start. Last year, you virtually never saw a bird on it when it was all under grass, and now there's some big lapwing flocks at night. There's quite a lot of rooks come here to feed. Um, it's very easy to criticise the farmer, but remember that the food supply is the factor of any bird life uh, limiting number. And yeah. we supply far more food take from on this airfield now than, uh, than the RAF yeah, did. Yes. To those who find small fields and high hedges more attractive than wide open spaces, the argument may not sound completely convincing. But Dennis Weston is clearly sincere in his concern for the look of the countryside. Finally, of course, yeah. one is left with the impression of size. You far, roughly yeah. speaking, 5,000 acres, and you yeah. started with 400. 100. How much is too much? Uh, when I no longer enjoy it. Have you any <laughs> idea when that'll be? I mean, obviously, <laughs> then still got bags of energy. The whole of Lincolnshire, maybe? No, 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 no. Half of Lincolnshire. <laughs> No, that's an unfair question. It is an unfair <laughs> question, <laughs> but it's an interesting question because there are people yeah, in England yeah, who yeah. say that 500 yeah. acres per man is plenty. Yeah. Some people would say 250. Yeah. Uh, you're a living disproof of this particular yeah. rule because yeah. you clearly farm this yeah. farm yeah. well. Well, put it this way. Um, I, uh, there's a competition all the time. If I don't do my job properly, I'm a tenant farmer on about half of my land. I have to pay the going rate for... Um, my uh, rents, I have to, my costs are always rising, and my costs rise roughly about 20% a year, as you know, and the price of our produce that we sell is nearly static. So unless I do it well, I'm out on my ear. Do you think that when it comes to farming, big is beautiful? Uh, not, not necessarily, no. Uh, I'm a great believer in free enterprise, and I, I also believe that uh, it's our job to make the best of our assets, which is our land and our capital. And if I don't make that the best use of that, somebody else will. What differentiates you from most other farmers in this country who may have started out with a similar acreage at about the similar time, but have remained at that acreage? Why have you increased in size and they haven't? Well, I set out from the start to do it, and I find that if I don't have some challenges in life, it's a bit dull. So you take up the challenge, and basically they probably ignored the challenge? Well, possibly there's... We can't all do the same thing. 